Hello, I'm Bob Beale. We're here today with Professor Bryn Hibbert, who's Professor of Analytical Chemistry at the, in the School of Chemistry at the University of New South Wales. Bryn, what is it that you analyse? <laughs> well, we analyse almost anything. If you think about it, the world is just made up of chemicals, and we've got so many questions we want to answer, like, can we eat the food, can we drink the water, can we breathe the air next to the nuclear reactor? And my job is to find out ways of delivering those answers to the public. Mm, so you're, you're going about breaking chemicals down to find out what the constituent parts are? Perhaps, although not always, that is not always necessary. Uh, we can analyse molecules down to individual atoms if that's what we really want. But often the, the question that we're being asked is solved at a lot higher level. So we deal with mixtures of things, uh, very complicated mixtures. If you think of any health measurement that they make on your blood or uh, in your body, the number of chemicals is just legion and there's no way that we're going to dissect them all. Hmm. So we will tell you what's wrong with you by just very, being very selective so what you're saying is that, that the, the chemistry you do is a really practical one. It's, it's not so much about trying to answer higher questions as, as in the no. service of society. Absolutely. Yeah. No, we answer what people want to know. Are there drugs in the consignment? Uh, as a sport, as an athlete, taken drugs to, to enhance his uh, performance? Uh, or is the nasty smell going to kill everybody in the region? Mm. Speaking of nasty smells, you, you were the co-inventor of the electronic nose, weren't you? Yes, indeed. Yes, we've invented this thing. It's called an electronic nose, and perhaps people have heard of uh, electronic ears and with cochlea, uh, and even now electronic eyes, which we're working on. Our electronic nose isn't trying to um, replace the human nose, but it's trying to give us the same kind of information. So, can you tell me how you would yep. practically use how that? How does it? Well, for, and how, it for, and how, for yeah. sampling wine, for example. Yes, indeed. I'm thinking of people who use their noses professionally. Yes, uh, and indeed, I've, I've, I was on the old ABC Quantum on bon uh, Bronte Beach with some wine, uh, in which we were pouring a glass for the professor, a glass for the interviewer, and a glass for the electronic nose. Mm -hmm. And I put my electronic nose over it, and I looked at my computer screen, and I said, "Yes, it's a Chardonnay." You've used the, um, the electronic nose in, in a very practical way to, to combat graffiti or to help people combat graffiti. Indeed. The idea is that if you're a graffiti artist and you're about to spray paint a wall, as you let off your aerosol can, it gives off the paint but also the solvents that are in it. So that painty, solventy smell that we all know when we, when we do house painting. And that's a very unique smell. It's a very unique signature, if you, if you like. And normally people don't do that at midnight on a wall in the middle of Sydney, say. So our little devices, and they're very small and very portable, uh, can sit up uh, high or wherever is convenient and sniff the air around them from about 40 or 50 metres. We can pick up a, a two or three second right. blast of, a, uh, of one of these spray paints. Uh, it then has um, a mobile phone in it. So when the particular pattern of the solvents we're looking for comes up, uh, it rings the police, the security, or whoever. Mm. And indeed, we've caught people. Yeah, so it, it works kind of like a security camera, but it's a security nose. It's indeed a security nose. And in fact, people have thought about having them at airports, sniffing for drugs or bombs or what have you. Mm. Because the ideal thing about it is that it's uh, non-invasive. It just sits there and smells the air. So you, you, you are working with the police in, in other ways, aren't you, in, in, uh, in forensic science, yeah. so to speak, looking at, 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 the, at illegal drugs too? Well, yes, actually, with my other hat on, I'm, I'm very interested in importation of heroin, cocaine, uh, manufacture of amphetamines, uh, and uh, also in sports drug testing uh, as well. So with my broader interest in both the way that we analyse data uh, and analytical chemistry in general, I've been working with government uh, agencies in something called the Heroin Signature Program. Uh, and the idea is that we, uh, we seize heroin at the borders, occasionally you get whole ships full of white powder and so on. Uh, there's no real argument that it's not heroin and you don't need a professor of analytical chemistry to tell you that. But what we can do now is analyse all the impurities in the, in the consignment, and then that allows us to go back and pinpoint perhaps where it came from. So we can say it came from the Golden Triangle, 
uh, Afghanistan, of course, that's now increasing, uh, coming into Australia. And it turns out that although the eventual heroin molecules are the same, how they've been processed, how the opium pop is being processed, gives them their own unique signatures, and that's what we can pick out. How closely can you pinpoint the origin of the, of the opium? Heroin, we can get down to a few sub-regions. So at the moment, we look at Southeast Asia, which is the Golden Triangle, Southwest Asia, which is Afghanistan, South America, and Mexico. Those are the main regions. And then within those, we've got two or three. The best thing to do, though, is cocaine because a few years ago, probably one of the biggest advances in analytical chemistry was something called stable isotope uh, mass spectrometry. This is measuring the ratio of isotopes. Long story, but essentially what we can now do is we can pinpoint uh, cocaine to the exact valley in South America. So we can take our samples and say, oh, you know, Mrs. Somebody's been at it again, you know. And, the, and because the, the molecules, the actual cocaine molecules in the, in, in the, in the cocoa plant have this, abs this wonderful signature that we can now pick up. And so there's been great strides in, in, in the intelligence that we gather. It's been very exciting. So, so it's as much helping in understanding where the stuff is coming from, who's growing, as it is in, in prosecuting somebody for the importation. Very much. Uh, yeah. to, to say that this is a cocaine shipment doesn't require a, a, it requires sophisticated analytical chemistry, but that's very well known. It's really then what happens. You know, what can what can, what intelligence can we glean? Mm. How can we help the police for to look for future importations and where to look? Uh, if if something like some heroin hits the streets. Uh, is it the same heroin that that's, we find in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane? Mm. And if it is, then perhaps we can say something about the, the distribution and so on here. Mm. Let's move on to sports drug testing just very quickly. Um, the, <laughs> it's had such a lot of publicity and athletes are always trying to, mm. to cheat. Um, for whatever, whatever reason. Money, how, how actually, much I of, think. <laughs> how much of a battle is that to stay ahead of those guys? Yeah. We, we read about the innovation and the, the, the illegal chemists. Sure, and, and it is, and, and there's, there's two problems that we're finding. Uh, both uh, the, the illegal end are using very good chemists, as good as us, really, and so they're producing new molecules that do more or less the same thing. Also, the law has a lot to answer for, because the uh, the litigation that we're to try and prosecute somebody and prove that they've taken a banned substance uh, in circumstances which they will then get banned from sport is becoming harder and harder. Almost everybody appeals uh, and so often they can get off on, on small technicalities of this this form wasn't signed properly and so on. Um, my student at the National Measurement Institute is actually looking at, in fact, uh, one of these stable isotope me measurement methods that got Floyd Landis, uh, the Tour de France uh, uh, winner who was stripped of the title a couple of, ye couple of years ago. And he, he was done for taking testosterone, which is a steroid, um, uh, the night before the final race, I think he'd had an accident and it was claimed that he'd taken this drug and indeed eventually he was prosecuted and uh, banned and his title was stripped. And we're now trying to look at this method for absolutely nailing people who take illegal steroids. Mm. And we've, we, it's, it's happened and it's been very successful. And it's all because, I might tell you, that all your steroids, your testosterone, and all the other th those kinds of steroids in your body come from cholesterol. I didn't know that. You know, it's surprising. You learn something all the time. Mm. And you make it from cholesterol. And it, so it turns out that the testosterone that you take from outside only comes from soya beans. So we can get this soya bean signature amidst all of these other homegrown steroids. And it's a unique way of, of testing you. And so we, we've caught heaps and heaps of people. That's fascinating. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you today, Bryn Hibbert. Thank you very much. Thanks.